What's up, everybody? Matt Gajewski here, back again with the Osmo team, talking some college football DFS. Ahead of Friday, November the 12th, we have a two-game slate. Before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. Bringing you behind the glass, taking a look at our player usage data tool. This is where you can find all of the opportunity metrics for the individual players on the slate. We have this as well as ownership projections, regular projections, everything you could possibly need to dominate college football DFS. And first things first, we are going to kick this off with Cincinnati taking on USF. A Cincinnati team somewhat limping their way through the season undefeated, but they are still 23 and a half point favorites over South Florida. It is a 58 and a half point total, just a two game slate. So even though Cincinnati has not been the most dynamic offense, just 63 plays per game, pretty balanced in terms of pass rate. They still need to be targeted because the implied team total is so high here. So Cincinnati is going to be a priority. That means Desmond Ritter is automatically a top two quarterback. On a main slate, you can make arguments for fading him. Only 27 and a half attempts per game. Not as much rushing ability this year as we've seen in the past. He's been well over 500 yards in each of his first three years. And it looks like he's going to fall well short of that this year. But because of the implied team total, Ritter is just the safest quarterback option we have on the slate. So low risk contests certainly need to be looking at him. You could fade in GPPs, but still going to be a dicey situation. In the running back field, we have Jerome Ford. He's banged up right now and just completely questionable. We don't know if he's going to play, so this is going to come down to late game news. But Ford is excellent when healthy, averaging well over 100 total yards per game. Good pass catcher, too. He's going to take advantage of a USF run defense, allowing over 220 rushing yards per game. If he misses the game, it's going to be a timeshare between Ryan Montgomery and Charles McClelland both extremely cheap on this slate playing either of them completely fine montgomery has been more efficient on limited opportunities but again we're dealing with small samples here these two should split and become excellent plays as huge favorites in this very good matchup in the receiving game alec pierce is the number one he will fluctuate wildly depending on game script he averages 5.9 targets over the course of the year 66 receiving yards but a lot of volatility with Pierce. Michael Young is technically the wide receiver too, but he's increasingly splitting time with Tyler Scott, Trey Tucker. But if you are paying down, it would be Michael Young for me. At tight end, you also have Leonard Taylor and Josh Wiley splitting a lot of time. Taylor actually has more targets per game on the year, but Wiley's been just slightly more dynamic, 220 yards to 185. But Taylor, again, just 3K flat if you're going to captain him. Basically, this the stone minimum right above it. He's somebody you can look to if you just need to punt Wiley a little more expensive, I would rather pay down for a Michael Young or a Leonard Taylor than get up to a Josh Wiley. On the USF side, you have Timmy McLean, that quarterback. He's back healthy. And McLean, he's cheap. He's mobile. He just runs into perhaps the most difficult matchup of his season against Cincinnati's elite defense. But McLean has multiple paths to getting there. Overall, USF is fairly run heavy, but they're about average in terms of play rate. So McLean is a contrarian option to target today. 263, 263 yards already on the ground this year. In the backfield, it's kind of a complete mess. Jaron Mangum splits time with Kelly Joyner, with Brian Beatty, and they're in a tough matchup. Cincinnati is a little bit weaker on the ground, but you're still talking about a team that's an underdog by three scores. So how many backs do we really want to take from this dicey situation for me it's purely gpps and maybe that's even a little bit risky in the receiving game usf has narrowed their opportunity between xavier weaver jimmy horm and omari and dollison these guys are basically playing almost every snap at wide receiver demarcus gregory rotates in a little bit with like a, a bryce miller but you're not seeing too much of these ancillary receivers at this point weaver's the target alpha he's averaging 8.5 targets per game 72 yards per game He's a little more expensive, but still comfortable getting to him. Jimmy Horn's the cheaper receiver I'd rather get to. 3.3 targets per game to Dallas 2.9. But ultimately, both are fine targets for GPPs. So yeah, I'm okay playing a cheap receiver as a run back to Cincinnati stack. And you probably need someone on USF just because it's a two-game slate. But again, Leonard Taylor is the stone minimum. And then Ryan Montgomery, Charles McClellan are the stone minimum. Those are players I would be looking to over the USF guys. Second game. Wyoming taking on Boise State, 14-point spread in favor of Boise, 47.5-point total, so pretty low here. Wyoming's just really slow and run-heavy. They depress the pace of their opponents, which probably affects Boise, a team which is playing at an above-average pace and about average in terms of pass rate. But Wyoming going to slow teams down. 
Wyoming started Levi Williams in their most recent game. He rushed for over 100 yards, but he played poorly as a passer, committed a lot of turnovers. So I don't think there's a lot of job security with this quarterback room. Williams should get the start again, but if he plays poorly, maybe you see Chambers come in and play a little bit. But fortunately, Wyoming draws a great matchup on the ground, which Levi Williams can't exploit, Boise allowing nearly 175 yards per game. Interestingly, Wyoming moved to a bit of a timeshare between Zazavian Valade and Titus Swen. Swen actually outcarried him 21 to 18, but you still have Valade as the team's preferred pass catcher. He still had three targets and he's averaging four targets per game over Wyoming's last four contests. So Valade is expensive. He takes on a good matchup here. I'm a little worried about Titus Swen being increasingly involved here, but at the same time, Zazavian Valade gives you the safer floor with his receiving, which Likely factors in today as Wyoming is a two touchdown underdog, but Swen, he's a fine play if you cannot get up to Valade. They both should see a fair amount of work. In the receiving game, Aiden Eberhart went down with a season ending injury. Isaiah Nayer is the leading receiver either way. 6.6 targets per game, 51 yards for Nayer. And now you probably see tight end Trayton Welch and receiver Joshua Cobbs work into a larger role. Cobbs is 3,200, so right above the stone minimum. Welch is 38. Both of them should average more than the three targets per game they've been seeing on the year, but still just GPP plays in a low volume pass attack. On the other side, Hank Bachmeyer is your other low risk quarterback. Most cash games are going to have the Bachmeyer Ritter combination. Bachmeyer is not mobile whatsoever, but he does offer a lot as a passer. Again, a really fast offense, 275 yards per game for Bachmeyer, 34 and a half attempts. He's been well over 300 yards in plenty of contests this year. So that's where his upside comes from. Easy to stack to Khalil Shakir underpriced for his role. He's averaging 9.1 targets per game, over 10 targets in the last four, nearly 100 yards receiving, and he gets carries in the ground. So Shakir is a fantastic play at his price. From there, you have Octavius Evans as the wide receiver too. He's been working ahead of Stephen Cobbs, who's been banged up at times this year, but Evans second on the team in receiving. He's a cheaper option worth targeting in this offense at 4,600. Cobbs has been playing, but again, he's been banged up. So he's been splitting snaps with Davis Cutter and even Tyneal Hopper. Those are some plays that are maybe just GPP viable, but again, you're probably going to get some really cheap options on Cincinnati tonight. So I'm not see, I'm not sure you need Cutter or Hopper, but potential options there. And then in the run game, Andrew Van Buren has returned. Excuse me, George Halani has returned. Andrew Van Buren, he's seen his role completely depressed, and Halani is a very important addition to this backfield because Andrew Van Buren and Cyrus Abibi Lokoyo have been extremely inefficient this year. So you have Halani, their only efficient back, a strong pass catcher, and he popped up for 20 carries in their last game, suggesting he's closer to full health. Habibi Lukoyo went down to 11, Van Buren an afterthought at three, and we have a good price on Halani today, 4,500. He should be a mainstay in lineups against a Wyoming defense allowing over 175 yards on the ground per game, and they're 14-point favorites. So big fan of Halani tonight. But that'll do it for us in the two-game slate. Thank you guys for watching. Let me know in the comments section who your favorite plays are. I'm Matt Gajeski on Twitter at Matt underscore Gajeski. Hit the like button on the way out, and we will see you guys again next time. Thanks for watching.